Hello, I'm David DeCosmo from ECTV Live. My co-host Russ Defender has the holiday off, but I'd like to welcome you to our special Independence Holiday Program. Today we've moved from our studio to the Wyoming Monument in Wyoming Borough, the site of a major Revolutionary War battle. And our guest for the program is a noted local historian, Bill Lewis. Bill is uh, well acquainted with the story here at the Wyoming Monument and uh, the battle that happened here, which Bill, of course, was two years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It came around, uh, uh, yeah, it was. It was. It was in uh, 1778. It was actually on July 3rd, 1778, that the battle here, the Battle of Wyoming, occurred. It didn't happen on the side of the monument. It actually happened in what we would consider to be the center part of Exeter. Uh -uh. Um, and it's interesting. This is about the midway point between the fort at 40 Fort, where the colonial troops were, and the upper part of, of the valley where the Tories, or the Canadian British troops and the Indians were. And this was really the center point. But most of the battle occurred north of here. Um, Peripheral things did happen here just a short distance away from the monument. You have Queen Esther's Rock where the night of the battle, the night of July 3rd, 1778, uh, she, uh, along with a lot, other, a lot of other of the Native Americans, tortured the captives of the colonial troops and they said that there were about 19 bodies surrounding Queen Esther's Rock and she would smash their heads in as she sang and danced. When we when we picture the Revolutionary War, we, we you know, we picture George Washington, we picture Valley Forge and, and, and that sort of thing. We don't always uh, think about the fact that really we have a lot of history right here. And, and additionally, when we think about the Revolutionary War, we think about the Redcoats, uh, you know, marching uh, in a straight line and, and attacking everybody. But you're saying in this case, for instance, Native Americans were a big part of the battle. They were a huge part of the battle. In fact, if you go up along Exeter, you, there's a railroad area that goes along to the left side of Wyoming uh, Avenue, the, the side away from the river. And it looks like it was built as a, a railroad embankment. In fact, there was a natural swamp, a lower natural swamp on the other side. And so as the, Native, as the uh, colonial troops went north, uh, to meet the Tory soldiers, the Indians actually attacked their side flank. They were hidden down the swamp. By 1778, the British had really changed their tactics of the war. Um, they didn't think the North was valuable anymore. They were more interested in capturing the agricultural areas of Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, places like that, because they had what the British wanted, the tobacco crops, the cotton crops. They wanted the agricultural areas. So the, the American Revolution moves southward very rapidly in the late 1777, early 1778. The North was really just, you know, it snowed a lot up here. We didn't have three growing seasons, so they really didn't care quite as much. So they moved their troops southward. And in the North, they got the Tories, who were largely Canadians or uh, Americans who sided with the king, and they said, guys, go out and create terrorism. And, of course, with their allies, who were the native, certain Native American tribes that were here, others were very loyal to the colonial side, but certain uh, Indian troops were loyal to the British and to the Tories, and it became almost a series of terrorist attacks. So the Wyoming Massacre was really terrorism. They came down, they attacked the colonists. There were very few soldiers here at the time. And uh, you see that occurring in a lot of places in the North, Cherry Valley in New York State, other places where these became more attacks of, of terroristic nature, where they attacked a, a community, an unarmed community. And, and we must remember that in that time, in, in, in that, you know, 1776, 1778, etc., there was not a Wilkesbury, there was not a Scranton. Uh... In 1778, they still didn't know whether this part of the country was part of Pennsylvania or part of Connecticut. Remember, right uh, immediately prior to the Revolution, they were fighting the yankee Pennamite Wars. When King Charles gave the deed to William Penn, uh, a little while later, he gave a, uh, the deed to the Connecticut people, which basically said, at this particular level, you own everything to the West. 
So they considered this the Western Reserve. And so, you know, we're familiar, Ohio Western Reserve. There's Case Western Reserve University, still uses the name. We were Connecticut's Western Reserve. So the Connecticut settlers came here and they settled. And the Penn family said, you got to get out of town. And they fought before the revolution. They both stopped during the revolution. They figured the British were worse than they were. And after the revolution, the Connecticut and the Pennsylvania settlers went back to war again. And that really wasn't resolved until Luzerne County was founded in 1786 and went on for even decades beyond there. Not fighting, but arguments over truly who owned the land here. Who, who were the people that lived in this area? Who yeah. were these people who became uh, the victims of the Revolutionary War? Most of them were uh, Connecticut settlers here. The people who fought in the, the, the men who fought in the Battle of Wyoming, by and large, were Connecticut settlers. They, uh, there were some Pennsylvania people who were killed in smaller skirmishes, but in this particular battle, their allegiance really was to Connecticut. And at the time of the Revolution, the settlements in Wyoming Valley that were Connecticut were represented in the Connecticut State Legislature. So the troops that, uh, well, Zebulon Butler, who commanded, who just happened to be home at the time of the battle, he commanded the battle. He was actually a representative in the Connecticut legislature, and he was part of the 20th Connecticut militia. How many people died during this massacre of Wyoming? It's tough to say. I mean, there's not accurate records, probably in the range of three to 500. There's different uh, interpretations of how many truly died. Um, it could be fewer than that. We really don't know for sure. But we, we yeah. now have the remains of those victims buried here. Well, what happened was after the, the battle in July, uh, people retreated to the fort. The next day on the 4th of July, 1778, the Tories and the Indians went into the fort and basically made everybody sign uh, a, a surrender. They, uh, they had to very quickly smash all the liquor in the fort before the, the, the take the, the, in, you know, the people who were there to take it over because they're afraid everybody get drunk and even cause additional problems. So after that, a lot of people got out of town. You had the mass exodus where a lot of people died to Connecticut and to New Jersey, uh, to various forts along the, the East Coast. They were terrified that the Indians and Native Americans and Tories were going to come back and come back and come back and continue to terrorize them. So a lot of people got out of town and went east and north. Well, um, the actions that did happen here and to the north, yep. uh, it, is that because the settlements were all along what was Interstate 81 then? That is the Susquehanna, Susquehanna River? River? Exactly. And this was land that the... Native Americans had claimed for centuries. It was just absolutely incredible agricultural land. The, the Indians were, uh, at that point, were actually very, very, uh, you know, they'd move around a lot. So they'd come here in the spring and plant a, uh, plant a crop and come back later in the year and harvest. Uh, so they really thought this area belonged 100% to them and were very disturbed to see the settlement that had actually started in this area in 1769. Um, it was, it was a very tough relationship from the beginning. Um, so after the battle, people got out of town. It was the end of October in 1778 before a recovery party was sent here. So, and, and the summer of 1778 had been extremely hot uh, so when they came here, most of the bodies could literally be flipped onto a cart with a, a pitchfork. There was really no skin and bones left. They had dehydrated. So the recovery uh, unit, led by uh, actually Colonel uh, Jenkins, Jenkins Township is named for him, uh, came he and uh, to the extra area. They called the area the land of the skull for many years because the things were scattered because of uh, animals and the, the deaths occurred all over. They recovered as many bodies as possible, put them into a big pit right along what we now call Wyoming Avenue, and they stayed there. And after a few years, people totally forgot where the bodies were buried. And it was actually the 1830s when two local uh, political groups, one pro-Andrew Jackson and one against Andrew Jackson, had a bet that they could find 
where the bodies were buried. So they hired a guy who was a diviner who, who would dig wells, and he had a big, long metal rod, and he went around, and within a couple hours, he was back in uh, William Swetland's office in what's now the Swetland Homestead here in Wyoming, and he said, I found the bodies. So uh, around the 4th of July, I think it was 1833, they had a mass ceremony. They had speakers. They had all kinds of crowds there. They had preachers. They had everything at this site. And to the side of all this, while they were going through all these beautiful ceremonies, there were guys in a pit digging up the bones. And they'd pass up if something was really interesting, if it had a tomahawk mark in it, or if it had a, uh, you know, some sort of a weaponry mark that went through the crowd. It was passed through. They had a picnic after this, by the way, a giant community picnic. But they recovered the, the bones. They were all stored in uh, cardboard boxes. They were sent down to William Swetland store, a building that is still on Wyoming Avenue. The building is still there. And they were kept in the back of the store, right next to where his store clerk, Payne Pettibone, slept. Now, it may be a bit of a coincidence, but a couple years later, Payne married the daughter of William Swetland and inherited all the wealth. It may have been something to do with sleeping with the bones that got this going. But, um, and then a year later, they built a giant foundation for the monument here. They interred the bones in, in this uh, crypt underneath the monument and then began the construction of the Wyoming Monument. And of course, every year since, there has been a very big ceremony here. As a matter of fact, you've had some uh, very, very well-known speakers. Uh, we have, yeah. The, the actual formal ceremonies, and, and this place has just always attracted people. And I think the interesting thing is this is actually the midway point between the battlefield, and, as I mentioned before, and where 40 Fort was. So it's kind of an interesting place to have a monument. But <clears throat> they, had, uh, they had occasional ceremonies up until uh, the 1870s. In 1878, they said we should really formalize these and they wanted to do a giant celebration for the 100th anniversary of the battle. So they did all sorts of things. They dug up the, the foundation of uh, 40 Fort in, in January of 1878, actually found the burned wood parts of the original foundation. The Historical Society has a couple of those pieces. And then they decided to have a, cer a formal ceremony here and they sent a letter to a fellow by the name of Rutherford B. Hayes, who happened to be the President of the United States, and said, why don't you come and be our speaker? And nobody thought he was going to show up. And about three days before the ceremony, they got a letter back and said, it'll be my pleasure to attend. And he not only came here and brought the Secretary of the Treasury, the Attorney General, uh, the Governor of the state came. Everybody stayed for three or four days. They had a full day of ceremonies here at the monument. They had multiple days of ceremonies and uh, parades and, and all sorts of events in Wilkes-Barre. And the President of the United States stayed through it all because to him, the Remember Wyoming is probably the equivalent to you and me of Remember 9-11 or Remember Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. It was considered one of the most horrible battles horrible massacres of the Revolutionary War. Just a terrible event. Uh, but by the way, he was not the only president to speak here. No. Um, in 1905, Teddy Roosevelt stopped at the monument, gave a brief address to the people that were here. Uh, Jimmy Carter was here in 2013 and gave an address not on the 4th but on another date. So this has attracted Calvin Coolidge hosted uh, the board and officers of the Wyoming Commemorative Association, which sponsors the annual event here at the monument to the White House in 1928. So there have been a lot of presidential connections with this particular site. And of course, uh, again, a, a big ceremony this year as well. Uh, Absolutely. On the 4th of July at 10 o'clock, we'll have uh, State Senator Lisa Baker as our featured speaker. Uh, we'll have floral tributes, we'll have a band concert. It's just every year just a great traditional American Fourth of July ceremony, again remembering the people who died in the battle. And it is something of local history and, and perhaps local history isn't taught as much as it ought to be. I think Absolutely. we've we've talked about that before. So for those who are interested, the, the Wyoming Monument is something substantial, something concrete that you can come and you can physically see. 
Are there other things here, perhaps to our north, that are still uh, uh, monuments or, or specific remembrances? You mentioned Queen Esther's Rock, which is really just a short distance from here. Right. Are, there, are there other things that people can actually come and see? Yeah. Well, there's markers. Uh, there's a marker in Harding, uh, Pennsylvania, to the Harding Massacre, where the Harding brothers were killed just a few days before the actual massacre down here in, in Exeter. Uh, there's uh, a marker to Fort Wintermute, which was actually, a, a t we believe, a Tory fort. Uh, as they came south, they stopped, they burned Fort Jenkins in West Pittston, which is very close to the Pittston, West Pittston Bridge, which is marked today. Uh, they came south, they got to what was Fort Wintermute, which was probably just a palisaded or um, uh, surrounded by wooden, you know, a wooden fortress type so, of sort of, sort of the thing we'd see in the old westerns with yeah, the, the wooden walls. on a very wall. small scale. This was a home that was protected by wooden walls. Um, and the story goes that uh, uh, Major Butler, who was the Tory commander from uh, on the British side, when the American commander, by the way, was Colonel Butler, so it could be a little confusing. But as they came south, they got to Fort Wintermute, and the Wintermutes came out and said, hey guys, you know, we're, we're pro-king. And they said, oh, that's great. You know, the problem is we got to burn your house uh, because we don't want a fort sitting. So they burned the poor uh, Wintermute families, and they were loyal to the king. But they also left the area. As they left, they bor bor uh, burned Fort Pittston, marker there. There's a, a, a abandoned school that's now used as a warehouse in, in Pittston. That was a site. So there's a lot of different places here in the area. Um, in downtown Wilkes-Barre, we have where Fort Wilkes-Barre was. We have where uh, Fort Durkee was. Um, later in the Revolution, a fall of uh, 1778, uh, of course, we had uh, the kidnapping of uh, our sister, lost sister of Wyoming, her family, that she was taken, uh, Francis Locum was taken from downtown Wilkes-Barre. That's marked where, where she originally was. Was that actually from. part of the war uh, effort at that time? It was uh, an Indian incursion uh, to, the part of the terroristic nature uh, was to steal children from families, to terrorize people, to make them want to leave the, the area. So the Native Americans would come in, they'd take small children away, and that's exactly what that was. They'd adopt them. I mean, most mm -hmm. of the cases, if the children were healthy, they'd adopt them and raise them as Native Americans, but it still terrorized a lot of the families. Um, and in Hanover, right at Hanover Green Cemetery, you have the site where in 1881, the last two people uh, were actually... Uh, scalped here in Wyoming Valley. They were both killed. They were two military guys who were on horseback. The Native Americans came over and scalped them and they, they died on the spot. And there's a lot of unmarked places. I mean, go to the River Common in Wilkes-Barre. That's where Sullivan's expedition camped for weeks um, in 1779, which was a direct reaction on George Washington's part to what had happened here in Wyoming. Uh -huh. And of course, it, to the Cherry Valley in, in New York. Uh, Washington knew he didn't have enough troops to, to uh, you know, protect every single small community. And by the time Wyoming occurred and uh, Cherry Valley occurred, he had just had it. And he sent his general, John Sullivan, and said, form an army and move north along the Susquehanna and just literally wipe everything out. Now, there is something, if, if, if any of you have ever noticed those historical markers, and they're, they're large markers, they're blue, and uh, there is a story on each and every one of them. And th those are local stories. Uh, and, of course, one of them that you'll see uh, uh, quite a lot of is Sullivan's March. Yep. Yeah, uh, Sullivan formed his army in Easton, came up what is now Route 115, oh. came, came down Giant's Despair. When, as he was coming down Giant's Despair, a couple of cannons fell off one of the wagons and while they were fixing those his troops were attacked by Native Americans. Two of them were, died, were buried on the spot. There's a marker on, uh, on Giants Despair showing where they were buried. Uh, a couple years later they said that's not a real appropriate place to bury people so they moved them down to the Wilkes-Barre Burying Ground which is where uh, Wilkes-Barre City Hall is now. And when they abandoned the burying ground in the 1860s, the bodies were moved to Hollenbeck Cemetery. So these guys have not rested in peace too much, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but there was an attack there. So Sullivan forms his army here in the valley, right along the River Common in, 
it was a big army. So they really occupied a good chunk of, of the River Common. And from there, they headed up the Susquehanna River. And their basic goal was to wipe out any kind of Native American settlement, to attack any kind of Tory or British troops. And they were very successful. Um, the Indians and the Native Americans basically took off uh, for Fort Niagara, which is on the, was on the Canadian side of Ontario, right across from Buffalo. And the interesting thing is the Colonel Butler, who was here in the Wyoming Valley, or Major Butler, the, the Tory commander, became the town father of what's now called Niagara-on-the-Lake. Yes. And he's the hero there, and he's absolutely the villain here. So go figure how history, it depends on where you live, sure. how history treats you. Sure. So that, that march was, in effect, uh, a revenge, in a, in, a, in a sense, for that terrorism. It was revenge, and it was wipe them out. We can't take this terrorism anymore in the different communities of Pennsylvania and New York. Just go in and just wipe out all these settlements, and that will end it. And effectively, within a few years, it did totally end all of the, the incursions. But the things that were destroyed... There's, there's a lot of writings about the people who went on Sullivan's March, and they were shocked how sophisticated some of the Native American villages were. They had homes. The homes had glass windows. They had doors. They had all sorts of agricultural things. They, I think Sullivan's troops were truly surprised at how sophisticated the Native Americans really lived in that time period. But where they found them, they burned them right down. And, of course, his army would have been made up from people who lived along yes. this section, actually volunteers, uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, just like uh, the, the, the Minutemen, in a sense. Uh, yeah, I mean, these were, tr these were colonial soldiers, and a lot of them were from New Jersey. A lot of them were from the Lehigh Valley, but he did pick people up here. And, actually, um, we had the first two public executions in Wyoming Valley during his settlement here. He found uh, two of his soldiers were actually Tory spies. They tried them, found them guilty, and they hung them. Wow. So the very first public executions occurred on the River Common in Wilkes-Barre back in the 17, uh, 1779. I, I'm amazed at what you can find here and there. And I, I, I know just in my travels up uh, uh, basically near uh, in the Poconos on a small road that would lead toward what we would call Camelback Mountain. Yep. There is a, a, a spot called Hungry Hill, and on Hungry Hill there's a small monument, and it is, in fact, the resting place of an unknown soldier of the Revolutionary War. There were really quite a few of those, and there were a tremendous numbers of recorded as well as unrecorded small terroristic attacks where uh, maybe a handful of Tories and a handful of Native Americans or just all Native Americans were to attack a particular home, set fire to it, kill the whole family or kidnap the women and the children and leave the, the husbands and, and male members of the family to die or burn alive in their houses. So it very, very terrible terrorism that went on through that time period. And, and of course, uh, a lot of the families here uh, have, you know, a, a, a relationship that goes back many, many years and not Absolutely. didn't all come in for the coal industry, as it were. Right. So it's interesting, I think, for people to understand that this history is here, it's right literally in our backyard. And even if you can't see specific uh, things like a fort that did exist, there's still some structures that exist. We talked about the homesteads, for instance. Yeah, uh, the original kitchen was built by Luke Swetland, who fought in the revolution, who was kidnapped by the Native Americans during the revolution and actually got away. But the Swetland homestead, the, the kitchen in there, he built in the 1790s, and the home is still there. And there's graves all around. Zebulon Butler, who, uh, again, commanded the troops at the Battle of Wyoming, he's buried in Hollenbach Cemetery. Nathan Dennison, the guy who was second in command, his home is still here, uh, built after the Revolution. He's buried in Forty Fort Cemetery. And you have a guy who was well, one of George Washington's bodyguards buried in Hanover Green Cemetery. So we have... Uh, bodyguard outside the area, but we have a lot of tangible connections that people can find to people who fought in the revolution and places where they lived, who, where they were very active during the revolution. And Independence Day week is certainly a great time to great time. think about these things. You get a great crowd here for the annual ceremonies of the Wyoming Monument. Are we seeing 
young people beginning to understand and take advantage of this? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's there's a lot of interest on the part of, of kids in local history. Uh, unfortunately, it's not taught as much as it should be. Uh, but when kids get a, a, fl a taste or a flavor of some of the things that happened around here, and they, they see the longevity of the history. I mean, the American experience truly happened here in many different ways. And so we do see a lot of kids coming to the event. It's a, the event is totally free. It's open to the public. There's tons of seating available, huge tents, so nobody gets wet if it rains. Uh, but you do see kids come along. And of course, you see a lot of older people who really have come to appreciate that little taste of patriotism every year and the chance to learn about our local history. Sure, and I should point out that um, some history is still being discovered. There have been a number of digs yep. in our area coming up with uh, artifacts. Yeah, there's, there's significant <clears throat> continuing Indian uh, artifact discoveries going on every day in northeastern Pennsylvania. A lot of it has to do with major highway projects. A lot of it has to do with just amateur archaeologists. But there are very significant places uh, around that contain really invaluable Native American artifacts and, and early colonial artifacts. This was a, a very busy place into prehistory. There was a lot of Native Americans in northeastern Pennsylvania, and particularly along the river uh, where people would come for agricultural purposes. They did that for centuries before we started to see the European settlers come to this area. Now, there's also those family connections. I happen to have a probably a great, 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 great grandfather. I don't know how many back that uh, uh, made arms for Washington during the revolution. So we have uh, chapters here of sons of the American Revolution and daughters of the American Revolution as well. And children of the American Revolution, sure. yeah. And there's some great stories with Wyoming. Uh, everybody thinks of it as, as just, you know, European settlers. But you had... Um, uh, an African-American soldier here at the Battle of Wyoming, actually two, um, and they both fought and the Historical Society actually has the powder horn of one of those African-American soldiers who, who fought here at the battle and died here. Wow. Wow. He was an aide to Colonel Durkee who fought in the battle, Captain Durkee, uh, and he died here and they both uh, died here. So, you know, it, it's, it's history for just about everybody. And uh, I shouldn't overlook the point you just made, that uh, the Historical Society of Luzerne County is extremely active, and uh, they have been able to gather some material from those Revolutionary War uh, days. Yeah, it, amazing things, hats that were left on the battlefield. Uh, again, we have a powder horn. We have a bunch of different things that were left on the battlefield and recovered at the time. Uh, we also have a tremendously exciting collection of Frances Slocums, from the clothing she wore to her lucky rabbit's foot to the weight she used to measure um, when she was cooking. So just really amazing things. Uh, there was a, a lady outside the area who was a direct descendant of the Slocum family. And one of the great things that she gave us, and again, no, explain the story, she was five years old when she was kidnapped in 1778. Down to, taken from downtown Wilkes-Barre, spent the first night under a rock ledge, supposedly, in what's now Francis Slocum State Park. And eventually, the Native Americans adopted her, and they took her west, and she eventually lands in Indiana, marries an a Indian chief, raises her kids, and all that sort of thing. So she's old, growing old out there. But somebody in the Indiana community had written a letter to an editor of a newspaper in Lancaster and said, you know, there's a, a woman here who's now older. She knows she was uh, at birth raised with a, 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 a settler family. They were Quakers. And she just remembers her father wearing a broad hat. So she thinks he may have been a Quaker, but she doesn't know much else. Well, the editor got this and he thought it was interesting, but he threw it in a drawer. Two years later, somebody published that in Lancaster paper. And that newspaper, just by chance, came to her brothers and sisters here in Wilkesburg. And her brother was Joseph Slocum, who was a community leader in Wilkesburg, owned a bookstore uh, right on Public Square, a very active guy. So he makes the connection. He travels to Indiana uh, in, in the 1830s to find her and finds her. And she remembered some things about the family. But what he remembered more than anything was when she was very young, 
her father was working in his iron shop with a sledgehammer and she put her finger and crushed her one oh. finger and of course here's now an elderly lady with a crushed finger so they knew it was their sister begged her to come back and she said no I'm old I'm my children are here I'm gonna die here and, and live here in Indiana so Joseph Slocum by the 1840s had become a little bit of a personality in the country and in January of, or March of 1841 he's invited to Washington to the inauguration of a president and the day after the inaugural he is invited to the White House and he he says to the new president he said I'm Francis Slocum's sister or brother and she's my sister and the president said oh how's she doing I haven't seen her in a while well it was William Henry Harrison who had been the territorial governor of Indiana who knew Francis Slocum so this all occurs but he wrote this in his diaries and in one of the diaries he mentions going to the Capitol on the day the president is inaugurated it's a very rainy day and he can't understand why the president's not wearing a hat and then talks about his next day visiting the White House and this exchange he has well William Henry Harrison died 30 days later of some sort of upper respiratory or you know some sort of flu probably contracted during the because, inauguration and he didn't wear a hat <laughs> So a really interesting piece of local history that we have in diary form. Uh, and it, it just is the absolute amazing story of the, the Slocum family and the latter life of Francis Slocum. So much, so much history here that fits in with this Independence Week. And we want you to take advantage of it. We want you to learn about it. We want you to see places like the Wyoming Monument watch for those historical signs that you see along the highway they are stories of real people many of whom were local people absolutely absolutely and they're just great stories here at the monument too uh, i mean if you you look carefully at the monument you say that's a kind of a weird architecture by the time they finally got the money together and their act together to build this Egyptian revival was the thing to do in the country. And if you ever look at the, the uh, monument at Bunker Hill, it's similar architecture. Yes, yes. Well, nobody knew for a long time who designed this. And years ago, going through diaries at the Philadelphia Athenaeum, which is an architectural library, somebody found in a diary left by a guy by the name of Thomas Walder a sketch and a note that says, drew a perspective for the Wyoming monument. Well, here's what's really interesting. This took a long time to build. It almost kind of reflects the building of the Washington Monument on and off and on and off. Thomas Walter ended up being the architect of the Capitol. The dome you see on today's Capitol, kind of the wedding cake dome that's on the U.S. Capitol, he designed. He was the second in command architect of City Hall in Philadelphia. So we're looking at something that one of the most masterful architects in the early 1800s probably designed. Take a day this Independence Week or whenever you can and come and see the monument. Watch for those signs. Learn about your local history and I think you'll, you'll enjoy and really appreciate what you see. Bill Lewis, thank you so much for joining us thank today you. on our special uh, Independence uh, Holiday Edition of ECTV Live. I'm David DeCosmo. Until we see you again next time, here's hoping all your news is good.